Good afternoon, CFTN. You have no idea how I love this weather. <laughs> I think every, I just moved from New York City about eight months ago with my family. Uh, we're in the midst of a transition plan where at the end of this year, I'll be taking the responsibilities of lead pastor and we'll celebrate and thank Pastor Jim for steering the ship of this church during the pandemic and turmoil and difficult seasons. Uh, so we're kind of revving up towards the end of this transition. I can't believe it went by so smoothly. Uh, I also am, again, so happy that I'm not affected by seasonal depression with, <laughs> with the weather right now. <laughs> I'm just full of joy because of this weather. Anyway, such an honor to serve here. Uh, it's such a good privilege to be able to preach the Word of God. It's such a huge honor. I, lo I love that I get the opportunities to just read the scriptures, meditate, pray, and uh, preach from the Word of God. Uh, we are currently going through the Sermon of the Mount. That's chapters 5, 6, and 7 uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a sermon Jesus preaches. It's not just good advice. It's transformative proclamation of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished for us. Jesus Christ is the only person who could change hearts. And that's what this is all about. Jesus changing the heart. You could change someone's opinion on something, but it doesn't necessarily lead to transformation. But if Jesus and the Spirit of God changes a sinful, callous, stony heart, the world will be a better place. Humanity will be fully alive. So before we jump into today's passage, the big idea of this sermon is that God cares more about your heart than your actions. Because if you address the heart issue the behavior will follow. Jesus said, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, unfaithfulness in marriage, vulgar deeds, stealing, telling lies, and insulting others. In the past three weeks, Jesus has unpacked the Ten Commandments for us by first starting off on murder. Really, the issue of murder is not the act, it's the hatred someone has wishing someone did not exist inside of their souls calling someone a fool, calling someone a person that doesn't deserve existence. That is at the root of not just murder, but war, ethnic cleansing. You name it, it is at the heart of the human sinful condition. And then last week we talked about adultery. Jesus doesn't say, stop committing adultery. What does he say? He says, stop having lust in your hearts because the lust in your heart is leading to sexual immorality. The lust is at the root of the sex trafficking. The, the lust is at the root of so much brokenness, God's beautiful design for humanity and how they should use sexuality has been corrupted because of human lust. And today, we get a two-for-one deal. Instead of Jesus saying, don't murder, don't commit adultery, He's saying through this passage we're about to read, don't take the Lord's name in vain and don't speak lies. Don't speak false testimony and don't misuse the name of our Lord. At the heart of those two commandments being broken is our inability to mean what we say. Does our yes mean yes and our no mean no? Or do we say empty words, empty swears? Now with that said, we love the scriptures here at CFTN, so please rise with me as we recite today's passage together. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. The word of the Lord. May be seated. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray what is about to be said. Let it be more from you, less from me. I bind anything not of you right now, and I ask that your Holy Spirit just convict our hearts, comfort our souls, be with us. We want your name to be honored in this proclamation. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we say, 
Amen. Can you imagine a world where everyone meant what they said? Politicians would be called public servants. <laughs> Lawyers would be looking for business. We wouldn't be stressed out when buying a car. Life would be amazing if everyone just kept their word. As Christians, Jesus says, keep your word. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. So simple, yet it could be so hard. But with God's help, we can continue to grow as disciples where we practice what Jesus preaches, preach what he practices, and mean what we say. Our words matter, our actions matter, and when our words and actions are in sync, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Another way to talk about this is honesty. Honesty is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Freeing thing. When we're honest with ourselves, we're liberated to get the help we need. When we're honest with others, we don't have to people please or try to perform to make ourselves look good. When we're honest, we can mean yes, means yes, and no, no. Jesus says, I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. When I was growing up, my dad would stop me all the time whenever I said, I swear to God. I didn't know it until I was like a late teenager that he was referring to this passage. He was trying to tell me, you don't need to swear. I want you to have character, son, to mean what you say. We should never take the Lord's name in vain. It's the third commandment. And so often when you hear movies or when you talk to atheists, there's this tendency for people to misuse the name of Jesus Christ. It's a swear. Swearing is disrespectful because it says that we could disrespect the person, the one who is sitting in the heavenly throne. And so often people think words are meaningless, but they matter tremendously. When we say yes and no, we're acknowledging that we do not sit on the throne room in heaven, that we are not in charge. Who are we to make such foolish declarations? to take God's name in vain like that. But we acknowledge that there is only one God who made the heavens and the earth, who sent his son to die for us, who's risen and alive right now, who sits on the throne. He alone deserves all reverence, all honor, all glory. And to misuse his name, to swear by his name is disrespectful. He is alone on the throne room, but yet humanity has this tendency to want to be God, judging good and evil, thinking they're kings. But we are servants of the king. God's footstool is on earth. We are on earth. And we want to be in touch with the one who is in heaven. That's why we do what we do, because we know we are nothing apart from the grace there is in Jesus Christ. So we should never, ever swear, because it disrespects the one who tells us let your words mean what they mean. Your yes, yes. Your no, no. We also need to be honest about ourselves. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Now, all of you are laughing right now because some of you dye your hair, right? <laughs> 2,000 years ago, they didn't have that. But the bigger principle is, you cannot stop the aging process. Doesn't matter what creams you get, what hair dyes you do, what kind of plastic surgeries you get. You are all aging, we are all aging, and we'll die one day. Who are we to have the audacity to misuse the eternal God? We have to be honest of our predicament. That life is short, that things often don't go the way we hope for, that this life is very fragile, yet despite it all, there is a God who loves us, who cares for us, 
who wants us to be like his son, who, who's put an end to death for us. Amen. Thank God. Praise the one who did that. So why do we think we could swear on God's behalf, using his name, disrespecting his name like that? So we need to make sure that we mean what we say, because God is God and we are not God. Therefore, we need to speak as if we're his children. All you need to say is simply yes or no. What a, what a boss statement from Jesus right there. Just mean yes, yes, no, no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. Yet there's this tendency for us to be bilingual. Lingual in the kingdom of heaven, but also in the language of Satan. What's Satan's natural dialect? Lying. He was a liar from the beginning, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says. If you look in the beginning, the serpent twisted the word of God so subtly and said, you're not going to die if you eat this forbidden fruit. You're going to be like God. Adam and Eve, they eat of the forbidden fruit. Their eyes become enlightened, and they're like, wait a minute. What's this dread I'm feeling? Uh-oh, maybe God was right. My hairs are turning white. Something is off. Something is wrong. It all comes through this being deceived and accepting the lies of the enemy. When we lie, when our yes does not mean yes and our no does not mean no, we are worshiping Satan because we're becoming like him, deceiving other people, not meaning what we mean. If we are truthful with our own sin, we'll receive our forgiveness. If we are truthful with the fallenness of this world, we will be super grateful for the finished work of Jesus Christ. If we are honest in all things, the Holy Spirit will take over. I know from experience, the Holy Spirit will not be present when there's deception and lies in the room, but when there is this acknowledgement that God is in the throne room and we are his servants here on earth and we want the will of the Father to be done on earth as it is in heaven, the Holy Spirit comes to those churches. Now, deception is interesting because there's a lot of truth in deception. That 10% of the lie or the 10% of omitting the truth, not telling the whole picture, leads to a whole plethora of confusion and deception. Deception when there is 19% truth and about 10% lies. It could even be 1% lie. It could thwart the reality of what needs to be said. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Satan again misused the word of God. He preached the word of God. He quoted scripture in an out of context, foolish, deceptive manner to Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? He knew this truth of scripture and rebuked the serpent by speaking truth to the darkness. We need to make sure that we don't turn ourselves into religious Pharisees and cyber Sadducees of the 21st century by cherry-picking the Word of God, but knowing the Word of God fully, wholly, so that we could preach the truth, so that we could preach the truth that is Jesus Christ, boldly, confidently, to the best of our abilities, without warping the word and image that is Jesus. Deception is awful. Uh, I've experienced this twice, uh, one in undergrad and one in seminary, where two of my classmates were compulsive liars. You know how much destruction lies do to a community? The person in seminary, she lied about her credentials, completely lied. And then we do white lie after white lie. And then it eventually caught up. And what did it lead to? A whole bunch of confused classmates and questioning the reality of everything. A little lie is a little leaven that could leaven the whole community. And if we don't stomp it, it's going to lead to disaster. No one likes to be lied to. Like, come on, we all know this. It's so hurtful. It's insulting. It just feels like you're worthless when someone just lies to your face. 
and we have to do everything in our power when we see the lies, we stand firm in the truth and make sure we don't participate in a community or culture of darkness and lies. Let our yes mean yes and our no, no. When we're honest, we start developing character. Something called integrity starts to emerge. Honesty, our yes meaning yes and our no means no, leads to Christ-like character. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of hearing about pastoral scandal after pastoral scandal. Uh, recently, I heard about a pastor who was sending inappropriate texts, which leads to often a code for saying the pastor was committing adultery. So often, if we can't mean yes, yes, no, no, our character is not ready for any type of Christian leadership or Christian witness. When I was doing my doctorate in ministry, we had a seminar on our biggest leadership failure as a pastor. And there were some amazing classmates of mine. I was the youngest in the cohort. Uh, one was the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance of Canada. That's 400 churches that he was the head of. He was my partner in that seminar class, that module. And every pastor would be ripping out their hearts about a church split or a church fight that they had to be part of, whether they were foolish or something, someone was foolish towards them. And you know what the common theme for the vast majority of church problems? The common thread that we noticed was someone who had the giftings but lacked the character. Someone might have been an amazing speaker. Someone might have been a very charismatic leader. But their actions, their proclamation did not match their daily walk. And then if you look to the scriptures for the leadership requirements in Timothy, with the, the epistles to Timothy, they have nothing to do with the giftedness of the individual or the anointedness of the individual. They have to do with their character. If our yes means yes, no, no, that means you have developed as a Christian. That's one of the most important things to look for in character. You mean what you say. That it also means that you acknowledge when you can't do the job or you realize that you're still struggling on something that you're working on. That's what being honest is. It's not trying to put on this religious mask and be, look at me, I'm perfect. No, no, there's only one perfect person. His name is Jesus. And I want my lips to be honest about my sin and honest about his grace and proclaim that it is only because of Christ. Here we stand as a church. Honesty leads to integrity. It leads to what the millennials love to say, authenticity. If we mean what we say, our yes, yes, no, no, the world will be a better place. Honesty is the only language. Truth-telling is the only language in the kingdom of heaven. Anything that's not truth-telling is of the evil one. When we are people of integrity, guess what? You could trust them. Trust is another word for faith. We trust God because he's true to his promises, true to his covenants, fulfilled in his son, Jesus Christ. We could trust him, that he's indeed God who is love, God who is just. When we trust in Jesus, everything falls into place because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we need to be people who are trustworthy. So when we hear people confess their sins to us, we're not we're speaking judgment on them. We are forgiven, so we extend that grace. We're people who don't gossip and have nothing else to do. We're people who speak the truth and don't want to dehumanize other individuals because we want grace, truth, and love to triumph because these are the attributes of Jesus Christ. These are the attributes of a Christian. Integrity ultimately leads to trust. Uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, he wrote the book Boundaries uh, and a bunch of other stuff. He's a psychologist, Christian author. His latest book is about trust. And he wrote this because he's seeing our society unable to trust one another. And a society that is not able to trust is a society on decline. 
And in his book, he breaks down what does it mean to be someone who's trustworthy. And he says, look for these five traits. The first one is, does the other person listen? Have you ever talked to someone and they're just talking about themselves? They have no interest to get to know you, but they just want to promote their brand or their personality? Those people might have a lot of acquaintances, but they have very few friends. Trust ultimately begins with listening. I'm here for you. I just want to know your story. Two, motive matters. What's the motive behind the relationship? Is it something to, to get out of something? New York City, all the mixers are about networking. You got to go to this networking event to make it. Networking, networking, networking. What is networking? It's just a nice way. I'm just trying to use other people to promote my business or cause. That's not always the case, but in general. Motive matters. Would you trust someone who doesn't have a pure motive for your best interest? But oftentimes, that's the case. If the person listens to us, understands our story as best as they can, and cares for our interests, that's someone you need to trust. But also, they got to execute what they promise. Sometimes people are honest, they're well-meaning, but they don't have the capacity or capability to do what they are saying they're going to do. And this is where humility is very important. Imagine someone promises that they're going to do surgery on you, but they have no surgeon degree. They're, they didn't go to medical school. You don't want to trust that person. That's a foolish decision. They have to trust the capacity of to execute what they're saying. Number four is character, which we talked about integrity. This ability to, to mean what you say, to be whole, to have a, a, a soul where you, you are not hiding. You don't overcome evil with evil, but you're able to do good in the midst of difficult situations. That's character. And the fifth thing to look for is a track record. That's an important thing to, for someone, to, whether or not they, you could trust them. What do their reviews say on Yelp? What, 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 what is their track record? All these things are components to trust. And if we're able to mean yes, and uh, our yes means yes, if we're able to work on our character, if we're able to be people who could have all these five things, our relationships will flourish, this church will flourish, our society will flourish, we ourselves will continue to flourish because we want our words to match our heart. Trust is super important. These are also important things to look for when you're trying to hire someone for work. These are things to look for when you're looking for a spouse. You don't know how many times people don't look for the ability to trust someone when they're looking for a partner. Guys will be like, oh, the person's hot. So is Death Valley. Death Valley <laughs> is very hot. <laughs> Girls will be like, yeah, I just want someone who's intellectual like me. I went to uh, school. And that was, that's always a common thing they would say. I, I want someone who's intellectual. And, and usually, sometimes it's code for, I just want someone with a good paying job. And these are the types of girls that they had Jesus on their dating profile. They would turn him down because, you know what? He's a blue collar carpenter. He's not really that smart. He doesn't have a liberal arts degree like me. Rejection. It's so important to look for character when you trust people for leadership, when you trust people for, for working together, to trust people in this manner uh, for all aspects of life. Trust is the fuel that fuels society, relationships, churches, and all types of relationships. And we may not be responsible for someone else's ability to trust, but we are responsible for our abilities. We are responsible to mean yes when we say yes, no to mean no. And we could only do it when we trust Jesus completely and wholly for who he is. God said no, no to humanity and humanity's sin on the cross. He said, that sin, that decay that's out there is not my intention. I need to put this to death. 
Jesus came on the cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was God's rejection of all the evil and the suffering and the wars you see in here on earth. But the good news is there's a yes behind that no. On the cross, Jesus said it is finished. Three days later, new creation cracks open from the grave. Jesus Christ is alive. God acknowledges that humanity is not done. There is eternity on the other side. This is a promise from the one who sits on heaven. When we accept Christ, there is this affirmation for the image of God. There is this affirmation that God indeed loves us and so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son that whoever believes will not perish but have life everlasting. On the cross, you have the rejection and the declaration that we belong to God. Thank God that he is person who means what he says. The scriptures are our tool to understand what he means. But if you never have encountered the grace and the love there is in Christ, I'm imploring you to trust him completely. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, trust him. And in that moment of trusting, there is faith. There is a spirit. There is a heart looking to be transformed. Let our yes mean yes and our no, no. Anything else comes from the evil one. We don't want anything to do with the evil one. We want everything to do with the living God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are true to your word. Help us be true to our words. Help our lips mean yes and say no. And that's it. No extra words. Help us be people who look like Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. And right now, as we conclude the service, if there's anything we need to bring into the light, help us bring it into the light so we can understand that you are indeed a loving God who cares for us so much. We give you all the praise today, and we thank you that you are true to your word. Amen.